Hi, everybody. We're going to get started. Welcome to our webinar. We're so happy to have you participate so we can share with you what makes the Ford School such an amazing place. I'm Susan Gindy, Director of Student and Academic Services. I will introduce our panelists in just a moment, but first want to let you know that we will leave some time at the end of this webinar for your questions. Since there are quite a few participants on the call, please submit your questions in the chat section and we'll ask as many of them as time will allow. I also want to remind you of upcoming, upcoming webinars in our series. Next Thursday, December 10th at 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, faculty will discuss the Ford School's approach to engage learning opportunities with research centers, our program and practical policy engagement, summer internships, and more. Then the following week on Wednesday, December 16th at, at noon Eastern Standard Time, we will discuss careers in public policy as well as the leadership coaching the Ford School provides. You will hear from Jennifer Niggemeyer, Director of our Graduate Career Services, as well as from several of our alumni. The final webinar in this series will be January 6th, during which you'll have the opportunity to meet Dean Michael Barr, and I and my colleagues in the student services team can answer your questions. I also encourage you to check out our events website as we have some incredible talks coming up that will help you get to know the Ford School and its intellectual vibrancy. Now I'm pleased to introduce our faculty panelists. Paula Lance is the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs, James B. Hudak, Professor of Health Policy, Professor of Public Policy and Health Management and Policy. A social demographer, she studies the role of public policy in improving population health and reducing social disparities in health. Brian Jacob is the Walter H. Annenberg Professor of Education Policy and Professor of Economics at the Ford School. He is co-director of the Youth Policy Lab. His primary fields of interest are labor economics, program evaluation, and the economics of education. Professor Jacobs current research focuses on urban school reform with a particular emphasis on standards and accountability initiatives. John Hansen is a lecturer in statistics for public policy at the Ford School. He also teaches the politics of public policy and other courses as well. As a specialist in comparative political economy and political development, he examines the ways in which and the channels through which political institutions affect economic performance and human development. My first question, I will direct to Professor Lance. What makes the Ford School curriculum stand out, Professor Lance? I love talking about the Ford School curriculum. So thanks for that question. I first just wanna say hi everyone and thanks for joining us today. We're really excited you're taking time out of your busy lives and busy days to learn more about our community and that you're thinking of joining us here. So the um, Ford School, um, both the MPP and the MPA degrees are really, they're generalist degrees. They're set up to prepare people who wanna have impact and influence in the broad fields of public affairs and public policy um, and really prepare people for a wide array of jobs and careers in the public sector, in the nonprofit sector, and also in the private sector, both in the US and abroad. And the, the curricula for the MPP and the MPA degrees have some overlap um, and there are some differences and we're not gonna get down into the weeds on that today. But in general, both of these degrees, um, the curricula for both of these degrees have really three pillars to prepare you for your career. Um, the first pillar is really strong analytic training. And this is um, training, and you'll hear from my colleagues more about this in a minute, but it's training in statistical and economic analysis, um, but also in political analysis and ethical analysis. Um, there's lots of different kinds of analytic skills that um, and critical thinking skills that people who want to have impact and influence in the broad spheres of public policy and public affairs need to have. The second pillar is strong and effective communication skills. And we really pride ourselves at the Ford School at um, how much attention and how many resources we invest 
in um, producing excellent writers and excellent verbal communicators um, through our program. And then the third pillar is strong management and leadership skills. So again, to have impact and influence in the world, you need the skills that will um, allow you to both manage resources and um, including people uh, and money resources and, and manage organizations, but also for leadership. And at the Ford School, we define leadership as having a positive influence on others, organizations, and communities. And that requires skills. So again, our curriculum, either you know the MPP or the MPA degree, those two curricula are designed to give people the skills they need in those three core areas, analytic skills, strong and effective communication skills, and then strong management and leadership skills. Um, the core curricula are, um, you know, the, our courses are taught by world-class, wonderful faculty, and a lot of practitioners we bring in to teach as well. And also there's an array of, an amazing array of elective coursework, both at the Ford School, but also across the 19 schools and colleges at the University of Michigan that Ford School students can take to go deep in the policy issues and policy areas of greatest interest and passion to them. And then also there's just so many extracurricular or co-curricular activities um, for Ford School students. Again, um, University of Michigan is a very large public university. I always say it's, you know, Ann Arbor's not the biggest town in the world. It's kind of a small, wonderful college town, but the University of Michigan is big and there are so many opportunities for students, again, for elective coursework, but also a lot of extracurricular activities um, that, that people can get involved with to, to buttress and enhance the required coursework we have in our, our thoughtful core curriculum. A uh, couple of things worth mentioning in our, first of all, our writing center. I think the Ford School is very unique for any kind of professional school, including schools of public policy and public affairs, and that we have four writing instructors um, whose, whose job is to support the writing um, development and success of our students. Um, our writing instructors are amazing. They teach courses and they're also available for one-on-one -on -one tutorials with, with all of our students. They um, help students with the papers that they're writing for classes, but also um, with job application letters. Um, if our students wanna write op-eds or other world things, they even say they'll help you write your love letters if you wanna bring those to them. <laughs> um, they, yeah, they're, they're amazing and they're all, they're all writers themselves. Um, they write fiction. Actually, one of our writing instructors has an MPA degree herself uh, and has worked in, um, in a state legislature, but she's also a poet and she just published an award-winning book of, of poetry. So again, that, it's an amazing and really sort of unique resource that we have for our students at the, the Ford School. Uh, and then the last thing I'll mention right now is our, um, our leadership initiative. We are really at the Ford School being very explicit and very intentional about the importance of your leadership development uh, as a student here. And again, we define leadership not as being the head person running an organization or running an agency, but leadership again is having the skills and the ability to have a positive impact and a, and a positive influence on others, organizations, and communities. So in addition to our required coursework in this area um, and a lot of elective courses in this area, we have a lot of opportunities for students to do leadership assessments um, and reflection on them. We are starting a program where our MPP students um, will have the opportunity to have some coaching executive coaching during their summer internship experience. Um, our MPA students are matched with um, alumni and other practitioners in the, air, uh, uh, in, in the area, back in the day when we could meet in person, they would meet in person um, uh, for um, uh, support and mentoring around their capstone projects, but also wider leadership sort of development. So. Um, again, we're really excited about the way in which our curriculum is, has been thoughtfully constructed, but all the other layers of optional and elective um, opportunities we have for students to build on top of that. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. That was very helpful. Um,
So analytic methods is something that the Ford School is known for. Why is this such a critical part of our curriculum and how is it integrated throughout the curriculum? Professor Jacob, you wanna get us started? Uh, sure. Uh, well, first, hello. Um, uh, good, uh, good afternoon, good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, let's see. Yeah, no, I think, um, so analytics here, we, we can define broadly. Uh, and, you know, I personally teach quantitative methods, econometrics, and statistics. But uh, my colleagues um, who work in political science and sociology and history um, teach other classes, some qualitative research methods classes. But throughout the curriculum, we try to focus on developing um, analytical thinking. And that is the ability to ask uh, critical questions, to uh, look for and assess data, different kinds of data and different information, whether it's quantitative or qualitative, um, critically. And I think the, the reason why we feel this is so important is because it's likely that whatever you do when you leave the Ford School is not going to be on exactly the topics that you studied here. And even if it is, the state of knowledge and the policy issues and the context will have changed. So we don't want to just give you a fish. We want to teach you how to fish, um, uh, to borrow some someone else's metaphor. Um, and yeah, so I think that's, and you'll see that like in uh, not only the statistics and econometrics classes, but in the microeconomics classes, um, our courses here are, are probably a bit different than those you've taken before. There's much less kind of rote solving algebraic problems and finding out what price is the widget, you know, in this case versus that case, but thinking critically about um, taxes and how taxes would influence other aspects of the economy and how one type of tax may not have the same impact as another type of tax. Um, and what are the various options toward government regulation and what are the advantages and disadvantages of each of them? Um, so, uh, and in the, uh, the ethics and policy making course, uh, there's lots of case studies. There are not kind of a single answer given in order to behave ethically, you do A, B, and C, but there's lots of analytical thinking around um, scenarios and cases. Um, so, yeah, so I think that's kind of an overview. Happy to talk uh, more on the q and I'm going to pass it over to John Hansen, a colleague of mine who is a key teacher in the quantitative course sequence, and he can give you some even, even more detail about that sequence. Thank you, Brian. Um, and thank you all for coming to our webinar today. Um, my job is to tell you about our quantitative method sequence, uh, which for the MPP program involves a two course sequence, um, and for the MPA, just the first of these two courses. Uh, but the core of the quantitative method sequence starts with our basic statistics class, which I teach every fall, um, along with one of my colleagues. And then the second course is called um, Quantitative Methods of Program Evaluation. Now, so all of our MPP students have to take both of these courses and they're really designed to be not just statistics courses, but st the teaching of quantitative reasoning embedded in a public policy sort of context. Mm -hmm. Now, I know a lot of you have probably had stats before uh, some other time, maybe in high school or maybe as an undergraduate and maybe it wasn't the most exciting class that you've had. But I really think it matters uh, in a fundamental way when the teaching of quantitative methods is embedded in things that you care about. So that when teaching of stats is grounded in public policy questions and things that really matter, then you learn it in an entirely different way. And I think that's one of the reasons why our quantitative methods training at the Ford School is so strong is because we, we ground it thoroughly in public policy questions. Now, in, at Ford, we've learned that it's best to offer two sort of versions of this sequence. 
So we have what's called our standard um, version or our standard sequence, which is these two courses taught in our sort of traditional way. And then we have what's called an augmented sequence. And it's the same two courses with basically the same content, but they're taught at sort of different levels of difficulty. Um, so the emphasis of the standard course is really to provide a very solid grounding in basic data analysis methods uh, the interpretation of data, the ability to think critically um, and evaluate uh, data analysis that's put in front of you in some sort of decision making context. Um, and to provide that sort of training in a way that is taught at a pace that students are very comfortable with. Um, so we've known that many of our students come into the program not feeling especially, you know, confident about um, maybe their math skills or maybe they're not so sure that statistics is, you know, going to be their cup of tea, so to speak. And uh, what we found is that, you know, the kind of environment with the right sort of pacing where students have a lot of opportunity to ask questions and really go over the, the core material in a thorough way is a very helpful style of, of learning for many students. Um, and then in our augmented track, where we cover all of that, uh, all of those same topics, um, we sort of expand on that. And we teach in a little bit more of an accelerated fashion. Um, the presentation is more quantitative in nature, so there's more math um, that goes in front of students. And the pacing is such that we try to uh, push students a little harder, um, especially if they are interested in making data analysis like a core and fundamental part of what they do in their future careers. So students um, can self-select into one of these two sequences. It's not a matter of testing or tracking or anything like that. It's really more about what um, environment students feel would be best for them um, to learn statistics and also what their goals for learning um, statistics will be for their, for their future. So in that augmented track, uh, we spend a bit more time, uh, you know, trying to teach students, as, as uh, Professor Jacob put it well, to, to, to be the fishers, because they're the ones who are going to need to learn how to do the data analysis and have that to be core, uh, sort of a fundamental part of their careers. Now, a lot of this, um, I don't know, I've, having taught here many years, I know that a lot of people come into Ford a little with a little bit of trepidation. They hear about this, you know, analytic methods training, and you know, it might seem a little intimidating or scary. So the one thing that I want to reassure everybody about is that our program is really well designed to accommodate a whole range of different uh, learning styles and different levels. So people come in with different levels of math or different levels of quantitative training. So let me just tell you about a couple of those things and the way that we um, provide resources to make sure that students are supported and feel um, comfortable all the way through. Um, one of the things we do is all our, first of all, all of our courses not only have a faculty member, but a graduate student um, uh, instructor who's part of the course. Both of us have office hours and, and there's a lot of time for students to get their questions answered. Um, we also encourage the formation of study groups so that students can work together on the problem set assignments and so forth. Um, another thing that we've learned over time is very important is that when we've identified uh, scenarios where students need a little bit of extra help, we've, uh, we've provided a peer tutoring program um, that you know, faculty will identify students and say, hey, would you like to take part in this peer tutoring program? And it's just a way to provide some sort of additional coaching and support because sometimes students feel a little bit uncomfortable asking a question of a faculty member and they say, well, I should know this by now, I know that, so I'm too scared to ask you about it, which is a very bad approach, by the way. You should always ask because we're, that's what we're here for. Um, and, uh, you know, but the peer tutoring is often a way to do this in a more casual environment that could be scheduled at any sort of odd hours that students want to work at. And so it's often a nice way uh, for students to learn um, quantitative methods. The last thing I'll say is that we do have a third course of our sequence, which is not a required part of the sequence. It's optional, um, but it's called um, Applied Econometrics, and it's really meant to flow off of the program evaluation course. 
And it's a range of, uh, well, we teach a, a range of advanced estimation methods that go beyond like the traditional linear regression model. So a range of causal inference techniques and working with kinds of data that um, don't fit the standard model of the, like the cross-sectional survey data set or something like that. And so uh, I've taught that course in, in recent semesters and it's a really fun class where students really come out of that feeling like they've learned a whole bunch of, of quantitative techniques. Um, and by that point in time, they're actually, believe it or not, they, they wanna take more. So um, if that tells you anything about, if we succeed at something, it's about creating this interest and desire uh, to keep going. And then students ask me, well, what do I do next? And, and Brian, uh, who's the director of the, of the policy analysis concentration is aware of a whole bunch of courses that we can then send students to um, after that. So thanks again. I'm happy to talk more later with any questions you may have. Uh, Professor Hansen, can I just also, when you mention um, supports, um, do you mind uh, saying just a word or two about math camp? I know we get a lot of questions about that. And since you are often the one who teaches that, I think students would like to hear about that. Oh, thank you, Susan, for reminding me about that. I meant to mention our math camp. So even before, uh, the first semester begins. Uh, we have a, a couple of weeks of when students show up and there's some orientation. And one of the things that we offer as an optional um, uh, piece of your training is a math camp. And um, that also might sound like sort of a boot camp of some type, but it's really not a boot camp. Um, I, I've taught the math camp several times. And what it is, it's a, you know, we run it over several days, a few hours a day. And the whole purpose is to help students sort of get back in the groove with math because you know you've had math but maybe it's a long time ago and you know you go back to middle school and there's this algebra stuff and then maybe there's some things from high school that have just kind of faded away and so one of the purposes of math camp is to try to you know get those brain pathways working again remind people of things that they've once learned long ago um, with a very like specific focus on math methods that will show up in our quantitative sequence. So like since I teach stats and I do the math camp, like I'm, I'm prepping students for, hey, you know, in about two weeks, you're going to see this formula and I want you to understand, you know, the notation here. Um, or I set people up to talk about things that are going to show up in their econ course. Um, now to understand and construct a curve that has declining marginal utility or something like that. So the math camp is actually very laid back and students often have quite a good time because they get to meet each other. And it's a, it's a good way to um, gently introduce people and bring them back into um, what might be a little scary, but actually turns out to be just fine. Thank you. Professor Lance, anything you want to add before we go on to the next question? Yes, there is one one thing I meant to mention before and I I forgot. I don't know why because it's really important. I was talking before about the three pillar core pillars in our curriculum, strong analytic skills, strong communication skills and strong management and leadership skills. I also wanted to say that cross cutting in both the MPP and the MPA curricula are first of all a strong um, commitment to public service. Um, we know why people are investing in getting a, a master's degree in public policy or public affairs. They want to have a they want to have an impact in the world. They see things about the world that are broken, um, and they they want a career in which they're going to commit to um, again working towards the, the the public good. So we have a strong commitment to public service. We have a very strong commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, and also, I think it's really important to, to mention that at the Ford School, um, where people come to study public policy and think about innovative policy design and, um, and policy change, we understand that public policy is a way to improve the world. Um, uh, but we also know that public policy is often the root cause of some of the, the structural problems in society, um, including structural racism and institutional discrimination. A lot of times, again, the root underlying driver of different types of social inequality is pu public policy regimes that have been codified. And so again, cutting costs 
our curriculum is the ability to think about that. What is the role of public policy in both creating social problems, but also in working to, to solve them? Wonderful, thank you. Um, my last question before we open it up for questions are, what are some of the other ways that students can co cultivate the tools they need for influence and action? Professor Lance, you wanna take a stab at that again? Sure. Um, so for the, the, our MPP students who are with us longer and have more elective coursework in front of them, we now have five optional policy concentrations that, that students can earn and it gets flagged on, on your transcript. So those policy concentrations are, as Professor Hansen just mentioned a moment ago, the policy analysis methods concentration. Um, we also have a concentration in social policy. I am the faculty lead on that. Um, there's one in public and nonprofit management. There's a concentration in international policy. And then our fifth concentration is in international economic development. So um, I would say at least half of our students do um, one of these policy concentrations. Um, also on this large campus, there are at least 50 graduate certificate programs that students can participate in. And here's where you um, dedicate some of your elective coursework to um, getting a certificate in a wide variety of areas. I'm not gonna list all 50 of them to you. I actually couldn't do that, but some really popular certificate programs among Ford School students are, first of all, a, a graduate certificate in science technology and public policy. And we, we run that certificate um, program at, at the Ford School. And it's, it, it, it's wonderful for those of you interested in science and technology policy. Um, there's a Healthy Cities Certificate um, Policy uh, Certificate program that we participate in. There's one on sustainability. Um, another really popular one is one on community advocacy and social change, again, on, on and on. And then um, we don't have enough time to get into to all of it, but the vast majority of our students are really active in um, student organizations, participating with faculty, both at the Ford School, but across campus um, uh, in, on their research, uh, which oftentimes involves working with a research center. Um, and there are, I'm not lying, over 500 research centers at the University of Michigan. Uh, you could get involved with. Our students are really engaged with volunteer work, with community work, being on boards, et cetera, et cetera. So really the sky is the limit for how you wanna augment and, and build upon and really um, enhance the, the academic uh, part of your experience at the Ford School. Great. Um, so we'll turn it over for questions now. Um, I do want to clarify. Uh, in my opening remarks, I had said that uh, one of the one of the upcoming webinar webinars starts at 8 a.m. I apologize; it's 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So one of the questions we've gotten is: is the Ford School is known as a community? It is a supportive community. It is a small but mighty community. Um, how have we um, fostered that, encouraged that, sustained that during this pandemic? Who'd like to take a shot at that? I'll, I'll say a few things about that and then see if my colleagues wanna, wanna chime in. Uh, obviously, th this has just been uh, incredibly challenging and, and difficult time for all of us in our lives. Uh, and then also, you know, he, here at the Ford School, uh, I, I will say that I, I am beyond proud of how the Ford School has um, come together, students, faculty, and staff, to try to weather this, um, all the ups and downs with it, and to stay focused on our mission of research, teaching, service, and policy engagement, but at the same time, making sure that all of our community members, both their physical and mental health, uh, are being prioritized for, for care as well. So um, I think there's lots we could, we could say about what we've been doing, but I, I, I think the main things that have made it work at the, the Ford School is one, we're, 
we're a smaller community, um, so that that helps in some ways. But I think more importantly, um, we made a commitment at the beginning for transparent communication between faculty, staff, and students. Um, we also made a commitment to have our students be front and center, um, helping us as a community navigate what to do next, how to do online learning the best, how to you know think about all the kinds of supports that students need, um, and including financial support, um, how to think about you know the summer internship experience. Um, and all of our students got summer internships last summer in the pandemic. They were remote, almost all of them, but um, it, it happened. So again, I, I really feel like as a community, we came together in a in a pretty strong way. It ha it hasn't been easy, um, but um, and we're st we're still committed to that, um, and we're committed to having our students be academically successful um, and and healthy, uh, both psychologically and and financially, um, as we always are. But we you know really made special efforts in that area. Wonderful, thank you. Okay, I'll just add a couple of things to that. Um, you know, as Paula mentions, it's been a really tough year, but we started, we knew it would be tough and we started planning in, you know, early in the summer for how to address uh, both the academic side of things, you know, how can we teach and deliver the same sort of high quality education that we've, that we've done in the in-person way, um, but also, you know, for the social climate of the school, because the community is such an important part of what we are. Um, and we, we definitely miss the sort of everyday casual interactions that we have just being around the, our building, um, where, where so much of our community is built. But we've certainly tried to replicate that. And just in like one small way, for example, we um, know that students often form study groups, but how would, that's much harder to happen uh, and when we don't see each other um, in person, um, they don't naturally emerge. So we, you know, we help facilitate that by creating study groups and encouraging uh, students to join them. And I think that's actually been quite, you know, successful. Mm -hmm. And a number of other ways where we just try to have like ways to get together online um, that don't involve an actual classroom scenario, but that are just more for casual interactions. Um, like, for example, there are some people who get together on Mondays and talk about whatever happened um, on the football game on Saturday, which has actually turned out to be kind of depressing this year. So yeah, absolutely. Wasn't a good thing to talk about. But that's just the kind of thing that that we've done. And you know, I, I feel like we're still developing quite a strong sense of community um, as I see the semester go on. Yeah, I'll um, I'll add to that. I mean, I think uh, you know, individual faculty have. Um, expanded office hours and other kind of virtual ways to interact with students. And I mean, actually, ironically, I've been surprised and I talking to colleagues, uh, other colleagues here, um, I think kind of attendance at virtual office hours is much higher than it was uh, prior. And I think in some ways, it's, it's one of these unintended benefits of COVID. Uh, um, is that it's, you know, it, it might be a little bit easier and more comfortable for some students to interact with faculty um, online than in person. Uh, and we're certainly trying to make those opportunities available. Uh, the other thing I think it's worth mentioning is there's been a few different initiatives that different research groups have started at the Ford School to directly address the kind of COVID pandemic and to help uh, state and local organizations and agencies respond to it. And I think that's you know, been a really nice part of the training, but also kind of a community building experience uh, in and of itself. There's um, the COVID, I think we call it CCC, COVID Consulting Corps, um, this past uh, spring and summer, and some MPP students were working with local entities to try to help them work through all of the forms that various federal agencies were requiring them to fill out to get um, relief funding. Uh, and that was, you know, incredibly appreciated by the local uh, agency partners, but also I think you know, added to the educational and social experience of students here. Wonderful, thank you. 
Um, so this next question is about the application process um, where we ask for previous quantitative and analysis experience, academic or professional. Um, what would precisely be the requirement? Will a course taken in a semester during undergraduate degree suffice? Will it affect the selection prospects if we haven't had the opportunity to apply those skills at our current workplace, but want to learn and utilize these skills for our future professional goals? Uh, we know that is a question that comes up often. Um, who would like to tackle that? I'm, I'm happy to say a, a few words about that. The, the first thing to assure everyone of is that you don't need to have taken statistics or accounting or calculus or you know any any sort of quantitative skill class before coming to the the ford school well well as professor hansen was just saying we we start with intro stats and you know take take people where where they are i would say when you're filling out your application the thing the thing we're going to want to attempt to assess is your interest in um, and you know fundamentally your you know your interest in learning quantitative and the the wider array of analytic skills that we teach here but also what has prepared you for you know wherever you are to to build on that at, at the ford school so there's you know there's nothing in the admission process where we're going to be looking for did they take undergrad stats did they take you know math um, you know, or did they take, you know, writing classes? How did they do in English classes? Um, what, again, we're really looking for people who are interested in building on, you know, whatever experiences and prior educational uh, experiences they've had um, when they when they get to the, the Ford School and that you're just ready to roll up your sleeves and, and ready to go. Now, if you've had, if you have some work experience and you have experience you know, analyzing some data using Excel spreadsheets, or you, you know, have other kinds of experiences that you think showcase to us, um, you know, sort of where your skills are now, but also your interest in building on those skills. That's what we would like to hear about in your application. Great. Um, John, I'm gonna direct this next question to you. For the quantitative classes, do you use a specific statistical software to analyze data sets? That's a great question and I'm glad you asked because one of the things that I wanted to mention but forgot about our um, broader training is that we offer a range of software classes as well. Um, we teach courses in Stata and in R and in Excel and then we have a general course in data visualization, uh, which works with various software platforms just focused on producing excellent um, visual presentation of data. Um, for our stats sequence, um, actually this year has been a year of transition because we often, uh, prior to this past year, we'd been teaching Stata as our main um, software platform for these courses. Um, but this year, for a variety of reasons, um, we, we added R as a second option. So either R or Stata um, can be used in our, in our stat sequence. Um, and you know, that was in part because the marketplace is changing and more and more places are using R in workplaces, but also because this is a year where access to our um, computer labs would be um, restricted because of the COVID. And uh, so, and R is free and available across platforms and it just seemed like a good um, time to make that move. So uh, we spent a lot of time and effort to uh, just shift that way. And I, and I have to say actually in my beginning stats course this semester, um, I think 80% of the students are using R and so the rest using Stata. I think we had a question about um, testing out of the quantitative. I think it was answered um, in the chat line, but um, Brian, do you want to say a word about that? Uh, sure, yeah, I, I wrote a, a quick answer in the chat. Um, it, it's certainly possible that, you know, students that come in that have a strong background in statistics or economics, um, uh, it's certainly possible for you to test out of the intro courses, and that 
uh, that's something that every year, you know, uh, a handful of students do, and they either use that uh, as an opportunity to take more advanced courses in those areas, or they use that as an opportunity to just kind of expand their skill set in other ways. Um, it's a pretty straightforward process at the beginning. When you get here, you, uh, or a few weeks ahead, you talk to a faculty and there's usually a kind of placement exam you can take, uh, which is just to check that you, you do have a, um, command of like the basic topics we cover in these courses. And uh, I think that's about it. Great. I see a question um, in the chat about how soon can students get involved in opportunities like poverty solutions or a volunteer experience? Uh, Paula, you want to address sure. that? Yeah, a lot of our a lot of our students just hit the ground running looking for all those kinds of experiences right when they get here and that that's great. Um, other other students want to kind of get settled, get into the rhythm of their, their classes, see what the workload's actually like before they think about adding on to it, working for poverty solutions um, uh, or one of the other research centers at the Ford School or, or beyond. Um, also, I saw, I think part of the question too is about ha hands-on experience. Um, so both the MPP and the MPA required curricula include a practical engaged learning experience. So on the MPP side, that's the summer internship that is requ required for everyone. Even if you come in with work experience, we want you to do uh, an internship uh, that uh, brings you to you know, build further skills and a new kind of organization, new types of policy issues. On the MPA side, um, and it's a one-year degree, uh, the students do a capstone project with a client that is external to the University of Michigan. And here we think of that this um, primarily like a consulting gig for the MPA students. We, um, and I'm thick in the, the, the fun right now of trying to match our current MPA students with a, a capstone client where they're going to have a project that has a scope of work and a set of deliverables like a consulting arrangement would and they will, the students will complete the, the capstone project um, winter semester. Some of the students will um, actually have that continue into, into the summer and then, and then graduate uh, in, in August. Wonderful. Well, we are Unfortunately, out of time, that came quicker than I expected. Uh, I want to respect everybody's time. Um, we may not have gotten to all of the questions, so I do want to encourage students, prospective students, if you have additional questions or want to talk to us, send us an email, fspp-admissions at umich.edu, um, or you could just go to the website. We've got lots of information about the application process. Um, but we're happy to um, answer any specific questions you may have. Uh, so I want to thank our wonderful panelists for sharing their insights and experience with us um, and uh, wish all of you a wonderful afternoon and look forward to seeing many of you at next week's webinar. Take care. <laughs>